I don't want to grow up, I'm a curious kid. The world has a hundred questions I can play with. So I'll open my arms and eyes and wonder every day till the day I die. No one really knows why. All right, our speaker today, Dr. Michael Werner, is Senior Staff Scientist in the Compu Computational Research Division at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. His life in science got going when he earned, well, maybe it was pushed onward, when he earned a bachelor's degree in physics at the University of Delaware. He then earned both master's degrees and a PhD in nuclear engineering from the University of Wisconsin at Madison. Before joining the Lawrence Berkeley Lab, Dr. Werner, Werner was an analyst at the Lawrence Livermore Lab in the Program for Climate Modeling, Diagnosis, and Intercomparison. Dr. Werner is, is author of, or co-author of over 100, 165 scientific papers. Most notably, perhaps, he, he was a lead author of the recent U.S. National Assessments on Climate Change and globally of the famous, I hope, IPCC, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Please welcome Dr. Michael Werner. Thank you. And I want to thank all of you for coming out on a, uh, on a, uh, a, a Sunday afternoon um, on a beautiful day like today to sit inside and not necessarily, necessarily hear the most uplifting of messages. I'm going to talk about extreme weather in a, in a changing climate. Um, this is something I've been interested in for the past uh, two decades, I think. Um, uh, and I have, this is the most important thing I have to say today, which is that everything else I say today is my opinion. And not, it may not necessarily represent that of the United States Department of Energy, the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, or the University of California. That's the legal stuff. So uh, one of the things I like to start out with in a lecture like this is not so much the extreme weather thing, but let's talk about climate change just to set the stage. People often ask me, well, what do you mean by climate? And there's this great definition that I, I first heard from a, a guy called Ed Lawrence, who's the inventor of modern chaos theory, but was actually a meteorologist at, at the MIT. This was a title of his banquet speech. Climate is what you expect. Weather is what you get. <laughs> and, and this is a really great definition. It's, it's, it's funny, but beyond that, it, it, it really is true. I mean, we live in the weather. That's the everyday variations in the weather. That full thing. It's not just the average of the climate that is the weather. It's the full distribution of all possible things that the weather can be. That is what I mean by climate. Extreme weather is not the average climate. That would be the tail of a long distribution of climate, the rare events, for instance. And we'll talk a little bit more about defining extreme weather as I get on to that. So climate change. Climate change is not rocket science. It's steam engine science. It goes back to Fourier, thinking about different properties of gases back uh, in the early uh, 19th century. And then Tyndall, um, in 1859, measured the properties of different gases. And so the radiative properties. So he shined light through it and measured you know, through, through uh, tubes of gas. And he measured the properties. And what he found is that things like oxygen and nitrogen are pretty transparent. Light just goes right through it. You know, and infrared light in particular is what we're interested in, which is heat. Um, he found that thing, gases like uh, uh, water vapor and, um, and uh, carbon dioxide and nitrous oxide, which are more complicated molecules, they're not the simple two atom, two atom molecules, but actually have three atoms. Actually, um, the way he wrote it, it checks the exit of the um, of of the the uh, infrared ray of the solar heat is what he wrote, um, and uh, and then things that are more complicated like methane are even more efficient at trapping heat energy, and this is because of, the, of quantum mechanics, which was also a steam engine kind of discovery, and so basically, an oxygen or nitrogen atom or molecule can only vibrate 
when stimulated by a photon like this. It's just a, just a dumbbell kind of thing. It's just a spring. Whereas the water, and you'll forgive this, can do that on each of those axes, but also does the chicken dance. And so it has more, uh, yeah, that's funny, isn't it? Um, it has more um, degrees of freedom, is the way physicists would call it. It has more ways to be stimulated. And so it's more effective at capturing photons and absorbing them. And methane, with even more atoms in it, can do more. Asking the question about what the increasing amount of carbon dioxide does to the climate is a very old question. It was, uh, I don't think it was asked first by Arrhenius. I think other people knew that we were changing the composition of the atmosphere. But Arrhenius asked, how much does that matter? And he wrote, and this is really important, in 1896 and again in 1904, which is a long time ago, doubling of CO2 would raise surface temperature by 5 to 6 degrees centigrade above well, not pre-industrial temperatures, above the temperatures then. Um, and in this, in, this, in this article, we now call that idea of how much does the climate change in an equilibrium sense, after a long time, if you doubled the amount of carbon dioxide, we call that the equilibrium climate sensitivity. And um, I was part of the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and in 2013, we wrote that this quantity is between two and six degrees. Arrhenius said between five and six degrees, he's right within our estimate 100 years later, more than 100 years later. So, you know, this is not new stuff. I mean, you know, so anybody who doubts that increasing carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, there's no doubt about that. Anybody who doubts that it, that it changes the climate hasn't really done the math. These are some old pictures, but they'll illustrate the point. Um, there are various ways of measuring the atmosphere and properties of the atmosphere before we actually started doing it deliberately by going into what they call the paleo record, drilling into ice cores, looking at corals, looking at tree rings, all sorts of things. Um, one of the, this picture down here on the left shows carbon dioxide in, the, um, in red, and it turns on at the Industrial Revolution because all of a sudden we're burning coal mostly and then eventually oil to generate power for steam engines and then internal combustion engines. And so, so in the last 2,000 years, the, the, the level of, um, of measured carbon dioxide has, has increased dramatically. In fact, it's increased, you know, ever in, 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 in the, the, uh, David Keeling started measuring it in 1958 when I was one years old. Um, at uh, uh, Mauna Loa in Hawaii because it's a very pristine place up high and, um, and it's been increasing ever since. We, get, we uh, up on the upper uh, uh, right is uh, the record of, t of thermometers since the middle of the 19th century. And again, you see a steady, uh, up, more or less steady uprise uh, curve in temperature, in, in, uh, in, in the global average temperature. Oh, yeah. So there's a laser pointer here, so that oh, oh that line, one, so that'll oh. indicate things on the screen. Yeah. Oh, okay. That, there we go. So that's that's the thermometer record. This is one of those paleo records from ice cores, and you can see this is a so-called hockey stick. You may have heard of that controversy. Um, I suffered through two and a half days of statisticians picking this thing apart, and everybody came up with the same the same uh, uh, answer that this is this is a real thing. Um, the statistics were complicated, and you know my head hurt afterwards. Um, I like statistics, but not that much. Um, <laughs> and and so you can see that it's really at un this temperature here is un which we're at now. We're at, we're actually about one degree above the the baseline um, now, which um, uh, is unprecedented in the last thousand years. In fact, it's actually unprecedented in the last eight hundred thousand years. And so we are the first humans to live in a climate this warm, which I think is disturbing. Um, and it's not just temperature. Um, we wrote in, uh, I think, the third national assessment. I've done a lot of these. I get them mixed up sometimes. Um, that we looked at. There, there are many, many different ways of, of, of quantifying climate change. These are 10 of them. Uh, things like, well, water vapor was really kind of interesting because that was uh, that's very accurately measured by satellites. That's been increasing since 1989. 
uh, snow covers going down, glacier mass is going down on land. Uh, the the, uh, the white ones on the, on the Greenland and Antarctica are the ones we're really worried about. But there's lots of things. And then finally, um, back to validating some of this 19th century stuff, um, some colleagues of mine validated Tyndall's work in a global sense. Just recently, actually, this paper was in 2011 by a young scientist, brilliant young scientist at the Berkeley lab, Dan Feldman. And uh, basically, this is the human component of the global mean temperature. And these are volca what volcanoes do. You know, we had Pinatubo, made a big dent in global mean temperature, and then some other uh, gases that everybody says are important that actually aren't. Everybody who's a denier, that is. I mean. Uh, and this is, you know, beginning the bad news. It's going to get worse. And these are, this is from IPCC AR5. I'm also a lead author on AR6, which is interesting. Got a ton of different tasks ahead of us there. And this is the observations. You can see, you know, that, that the climate change we've had so far pales in comparison to what we would have if this red curve is... I, it's, it's not a business as usual, because actually we're above this in the reality... Um, I call it the no policy scenario, and um, and that would put us at at about um, well about three and a half degrees. Uh, well, no, I'm sorry, about four degrees warmer than now. Um, by the end of the century, going you know stabilizing it doesn't really stabilize until you run out of things to burn, which is around uh, you know starts around 2300. What I mean that by that you stop burning all the coal and oil and pretty much drilled it all out, um, and that would stabilize around eight, nine degrees or so. There's large uncertainties on that, of course. But, you know, this is a planet that hasn't happened in, in millions and millions of years, and a very different planet than the one we live on. And in fact, I'm, I'm going to argue that this planet we're on now, one degrees above um, uh, the pre-industrial, is also a very different planet in terms of extreme weather. And then I'll skip that. These are some bad news plots about temperatures under various, um, I won't skip it actually, I'll tell you something about it, uh, various um, uh, emission scenarios depending. We don't know what people are going to do, so scientists say, okay, what if people did this? What if people did that? Well, if we, people didn't do anything, we have the no policy scenario. We're looking at um, uh, like six or more degrees warmer in the northern parts of the United States um, on the global average, just more in the winter, a little less in the summer. Um, pardon? We're about one degrees. This is actually warmer than now, I'm sorry, so we would be at zero. Um, and so it would be seven degrees warmer than the pre-industrial. And then this is, this is the one I call the, ge is, it's a geoengineering scenario where we try to limit the climate change to two degrees warming, so uh, globally since pre-industrial. That's one degree warmer than now. Um, this is the vacuum cleaner technology that I call it. Um, where you invent something to, to suck carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and then you put it somewhere. That technology, of course, does not exist at scale. So this is, you know, sort of the Paris Agreement thing. I'll have something to say about that in a minute. Um, it's not very likely to happen. So we're going to be somewhere in there. I'm betting on this because I'm a pessimist. Oh, I do have something to say about the Paris Agreement right now. Um, so you may have heard that in the Paris Agreement, they agreed to try to stabilize emissions at two degrees above pre-industrial, one degree above now, with a target that was really um, uh, agreed upon because the, the, the small island states are feeling so threatened of one and a half degrees above um, pre-industrial or half degree above now. The problem with this agreement is they didn't talk to any scientists. This was politicians. So there was one scientist in the room, and it was, it was an interesting conversation about what he had to say. Um, we wrote in the fourth national assessment just last year, 2017, that the chances, the chances of stabilizing at anything actually is zero because in order to stabilize the temperature, you have to uh, reduce emissions, constant, uh, emissions of carbon dioxide to zero so that it stabilizes the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And the Paris Agreement doesn't do that. It just says we're going to reduce our emissions by X amount, but that's not reducing to zero. There were aspirations to reduce to zero. Um, what we wrote in the National Assessment is that there was an 8% chance 
of being at two degrees at 2100 under the emissions reductions that they agreed to, but then it would continue to increase. Under the aspirations that they, they wanted to do, which is not what they agreed to, they said this is what we'd like to do, that there was a 30% chance of getting to that, of getting, of then stabilizing at, at, one, at two degrees. There's a 3% chance of stabilizing at 1.5 degrees under the aspirations, and zero of being at 1.5 degrees if you, under, the aspira, under the agreed upon emissions. Without the U.S. in the Paris Agreement, this all, this all goes to zero. There's no chance of being at two degrees, much less one and a half degrees, outside of the, with the U.S. outside of the Paris Agreement. So that you know, explains my lack of optimism. So let's turn to the topic at hand extreme weather, which is, from a scientific point, insanely interesting. Um, you know, big storms are really complex things, and um, as a result, they're really interesting, and so, you know, I get excited about going to work most of the time. Um, this is Katrina, um, one of the most, well, the most expensive storm ever for the U.S., although lately we've Excuse me, we've had quite a few other expensive storms, Harvey and Florence especially, and Maria. And Irma too, although Irma didn't cost the U.S. a lot, it destroyed um, Dominica and another of other uh, small island states. Uh, this is an atmospheric river hitting California, um, a particularly large one. Um, this, they, sometimes the forecasters call atmospheric rivers, which is a term we made up a couple years ago, um, because there's copious amounts of water transported from the tropics to California in these, in these events. There's, the forecasters often call it the Pineapple Express because mm -hmm. they often pass over Hawaii before they get to us. This is an uh, extra tropical cyclone as opposed to a, a hurricane is called a tropical cyclone because they, they originate in the tropics. The extra tropics are outside of the tropics, so they're different kinds of storms. They're much larger. They can produce large, lots of... Uh, of uh, um, of, of, of precipitation, and this thing here is a radar, a composite radar image, and I only put it here because I, 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 um, well, I had relatives in two states were out of power in Ohio and in Virginia for, for four days after this event. It was a remar it's called the Derecho. It was a remarkably coherent event. This is be outside of our current expertise to say anything about climate change on, but it was interesting, and, and, um, and I, I, I experienced a little bit of it, so that's why I put it there. And that's the thing about extreme weather. I mean, it, it does impact each and every one of us. At some time, you've been caught up in a storm, you know, maybe more than once. Um, one time I was going to a conference about hurricanes, and I got delayed by a hurricane. It seemed appropriate. <laughs> I ended up in Japan instead of China. Um, so I'm going to talk about heat waves, uh, not too much cold snaps. Uh, I, can ask, I can answer questions about droughts and floods. Um, I'm going to talk a lot about hurricanes because that's, that's the thing of interest now. Uh, tornadoes is one, another one of those things, like the Dere Show. It's like we have some ideas, but the, it's, it's an evolving science. Um, pretty much the ideas are all it looks bad, but it's, not hard. It's, it's hard to be quantitative. So what makes an event extreme? <clears throat> this is uh, um, uh, a hard question to answer because it means different things to different people. You know, I said I like statistics. For me, it means the tail of some, you know, in this case, a Gaussian distribution, a bell, a bell curve. It's these values here that are the extreme because they're the rare events. But if, if you're on the receiving end of a hurricane or a tornado, then it's an extreme event too. And so you could define extreme events by their impacts or by their statistical properties. And people do both. And so when you say extreme weather, it means different things to different people. And I can't get around that. I'm going to show you a movie, and I'm not sure I can do this with here, so excuse me. This is, a, this is an animation from a calculation that's going to show off the big computers at the Berkeley Lab. But the point is, is that advances in high-performance computing are giving us tools to analyze extreme weather in a changing climate that we didn't have five years ago.
So this is all the water vapor looking down. If you were an astronaut and he or she could see in this perspective, you would see water vapor. And what you see here are um, here's some hurricanes forming. And, uh, you know, all the, these are atmospheric rivers, these little filamented things. Every once in a while you see an extratropical cyclone, although they don't show up quite as well because they don't have as much water in them as these in the scale. There's some nice hurricanes going through. This is all simulation. This is not based on initial conditions. These storms come out of thin numerical air. This is just the chaos of the atmosphere, of the simulated atmosphere, producing these storms. And what we have here is the same calculation. This is the calculation for the IPCC AR5 and AR4 especially. And the difference between these two, and if you're in the back, they might look the same. And there's some, that's kind of good in some ways because uh, the change in technology doesn't change our conclusions about large-scale climate change. But the difference is, is that this one, I've divided up the planet into 25-kilometer grids or 25-kilometer boxes covering or grid chiclets covering the, um, the, uh, the planet. This one, they're 200 kilometers. It's several hundred thousand times more expensive to do this simulation. And this first one took me uh, three months to do 17 simulated years. Now I can do that in 10 days, maybe. Um, and I can do more than one at once, which we need to do because that's how we get the statistics. And I've done as many as 10 at one time on, on our machine um, called Cori at, at the National Energy Research Supercomputer Center, which is at the Berkeley Lab. So that's a big thing for me because if you, if you watch this one, there were no hurricanes in this 200 kilometer. You can't make them. But now with this one, I can, which means I can ask a question about how climate change affects hurricanes. The models the same between the, the It's exactly the same model. And the, same the only thing that's different is I pumped, I, I used, uh, um, I've forgotten how many more, 64,000 times more grid points, I think. And the initial conditions are the same. Initial conditions don't really matter because you lose the memory of the initial conditions um, uh, within a couple of weeks. These are multi decadal simulations. What matters is uh, the boundary conditions which is, in this case, is you know, what the carbon dioxide is, what the sun's doing, what the volcanoes are doing. And in this case, we've also um, uh, put in observed um, uh, sea surface temperatures and sea ice concentration. So it's not a full-on climate model. Um, it's, most, it's a model of the atmosphere and the land. About how many variables are involved in the state space? How many? Could you just repeat the question? He asked how many variables are in, in this model. And um, there are probably about 30 uh, prognostic variables, variables that have or solutions that we, uh, that we advance. There are hundreds of diagnostic variables. Uh, this is one of those. Um, the principal ones are temperature, moisture, and wind speed. Um, and then and, uh, we also, we also, one of our variables is called geopensional height, which is how dense the atmosphere is at any given point. There are a lot of variables on the land, and I actually don't know how many. Yes, please. Can you project into the future with that model? Oh, that's a great question, because I do. Uh, this, I'll get to that. Uh, that's just telling me that technology is, is, oh, she wanted to know if, the, if I can project into the future, and that's going to be the, the next slide or the one after that. Uh, but first, I want to convince you that this model works. Because I didn't, you know, when I, first served, when I first realized that I could make hurricanes, I went to my boss, and I didn't have a long simulation. And I said, you know, this is kind of like the talking dog. It's not so much what it says, it's that it's speaking at all. Because we didn't have that capability beforehand. So this is, uh, this was the observed number of uh, tracks of hurricanes between 1979 and 2005, which was the first calculation that I did. And I've color-coded them by uh, uh, categories. And this is then the, the model. And it's not perfect. But if I peel off the category zeros, the tropical storms, and just look at named hurricanes, you can see where the problems are. The problems are mostly here in the Pacific, maybe a little bit on where they start, although there's some actually uncertainties in there, they tell me, um, that this may not be as bad as it looks. And uh, then we peel off the category one through category three, and just look at the intense hurricanes or the major hurricanes, which is category four and category five. The amazing thing is this model actually produces category fours and category fives. 
And then uh, finally, this is to convince you that even the structure of these hurricanes looks right. This is um, a, a scatter plot of the maximum wind speed, so whatever it is in each storm, versus the minimum central pressure. And uh, the observations are the blue and the, uh, the, the red and orange is the, observa is the model. And so this is the Pacific and this is the Atlantic. And it does pretty well, but most importantly is that it gets the global number right. Even though they're not all in the right places, although a lot of them are in the right places, um, the, the observed is about 87 category zero through category five storms per year, um, and the plus or minus eight, that's how, many, that's how it varies from one year to the next. Um, and the model's right in there, it's 84. And then named hurricane, or hurricanes, so that's the category one through five, the, the observed number is about 50, and that's what the model gets. We, where the, category, the major hurricanes, the observed number is about 15, and we get about 8. And that's kind of what I expect, because 25 kilometers, it was a surprise, because it's not, you know, hurricanes are not that um, large, and so we're hardly resolving um, the hurricanes, but apparently it does fine. So you asked about climate change, and um, there are two stories on, on, on um, on uh, how climate change affects the, st the, the largest, most well-known kind of statistics of, of hurricanes. And one of them is we're very confident with as a community. The other one we're still arguing about. And, um, and I go back and forth. And so I'm gonna tell you about the confident part first. And the confident part is, is held up here. Now this is simulations of, of the real world now, that, that's recent past versus a, a one and a half degree future and a two degree future. So this was to address, you know, how, what's the difference between one and a half and two degrees if we did the Paris Agreement stuff. So I don't think it's gonna happen, but you know, it was something to write about. And what we find is that um, in, the, in the warmer world, and this is true in a, all, every simulation I've ever done, in a warmer world, there are more category fours than category five hurricanes. And every, there, now there are other folks that can do this simulation. These, this technology is becoming more available to the community. Everybody gets to that answer. Now, how much more you know, we, we, is, is, is different between one group and the next? But it's supported by theoretical arguments as well. There's simply more energy available. When you have a major hurricane, everything is perfect climate uh, weather-wise setting it up. Um, and uh, so that's a projection that we're writing in the AR6 with, with high confidence, is that a warmer world will produce more of these destructive major hurricanes. And furthermore, the most destructive ones will have higher winds and, um, and uh, uh, produce more rain and uh, possibly be larger, possibly move slower. Now, the, what, the thing that's less certain is what happens to the total number. And the total number is dominated by the weaker storms. There are more weak storms than strong storms. And our model shows a, a profound decrease in the category zeros and a little decrease in the category ones. This is the point that, this is the point that we're still discuss. I won't say arguing because they're my friends, but um, we, we, we don't all agree. And um, there are some that feel that... Um, that th this number really won't change. Um, most of the models say that it will, but I'm, I'm, I, I have some simulations recently that, that maybe contradict this because of the role of aerosols. Aerosols are um, the sulfate particles that we get from burning coal and oil that have sulfur in them. That has a, ver that has a lot of known effects to the climate. And it would appear, I haven't published this yet, but it would appear that that also modulates this number. It doesn't have anything to do really here. But, it, but so it, this is the point, is that science is still interesting. Um, there are questions out there that I don't know the answers to. If I knew all the answers, I'd probably just go home. Um, here's, oh, here's the, the, the thing about the, uh, the strongest storms get more intense. And so, so I've got simulations at... at, at uh, Today, well, that was today, uh, the one and a half degree scenario, the two degree scenario, and even the four degree scenario. And so the most destructive storms get more destructive. And they also, because it is warmer 
over a larger fraction of the Earth, some of these storms, a lot of storms will, um, well, if we go back, we can see it. See how they, they, they call this recurving, where they go this way for a while, and then all of a sudden they turn towards the pole, like going poleward. And so in the southern hemisphere, they do this. So um, this, this, as they go northward, the waters get cooler. And, um, and, and then they lose their intensity. But as it gets warmer, they'll be able to maintain hurricane speed farther northward, say, in the Atlantic. Um, but they still actually eventually reach a place where uh, something called wind shear, which is the difference between winds at the top and the bottom of the atmosphere, so the surface winds and then high, high aloft. Hurricanes don't like that. that. That tends to turn them on their side and then they, they, they spin away or they, 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 dis they disintegrate. Um, and eventually what happens is they'll reach that. And so hurricanes will never go to the North Pole, for instance. They eventually will hit this other environmental factor that uh, controls whether there's a hurricane or not. I'm sorry? No, no. You, you, there are other storms at the North Pole, but not hurricanes. And so no matter how, war how much we warm the planet, we'll never have hurricanes at the North Pole. They're all going to they're all going to stop, you know, around in here. Um, although that's pretty uh, pretty high up. I mean, you know, you know, if, if uh, you know, hurricanes start routinely hitting New England, and they do occasionally at hurricane strength, the category zero strength, um, that that could be that has happened. That that could be uh, devastating, of course. What is this again? Oh, ISST is sea surface temperature. I'm sorry. And another movie here. This is of an atmosphere. Remember, I simulated it again. So here we're going to show water vapor again as this uh, cloudy color. Then wind speed are the vectors, and then rain are these colors. And there's a couple of things that are cool about this. Um, one of which is that at these high resolutions, the storms are more realistic. They're not so diffuse. So they're skinny and, and, and very, very peaked in their distribution. But the other I want you to see is that at this resolution also, the Sierras are better resolved. Now the height of the mountains in a climate model is the average of the height in that grid cell that is covering you know, any particular spot on the planet. So over the mountains, if they're 200 kilometers, there aren't very many cells covering California. And so the mountains aren't very high. Whereas at 25 kilometers they are, and so um, I'm going to run that one more time. Oh, it went away. But anyway, the point is, is that in the in the real world, in the real world, it snows in the Sierras, you know, at Lake Tahoe, and not very much in Reno, because the mountains are high, the, the, as the, uh, the air is lifted, because as it goes over the mountain, it rains out or snows out. Um, and by the time the air gets to Reno, all, most of that moisture is gone. In the course models, they're not high enough, and so that moisture goes to Nevada, and it rains in Nevada. And that's, in, in the polite, parlance of scientific discussion that's called a bias, which is a polite word for error. And, and that's, a, that's a kind of error I can't bias correct out. And so this is another important reason why technology is really helping us make better projections of future climate because they're simulating the present climate more accurately. And for you know, relatively simple reasons. Although, you know, the, the, the computers that are behind this are not simple machines. So now I want to get to um, my current research, which is called extreme event attribution. And, um, and I'm going to discuss this at length, I think. Um, and it's motivated in part by this question. If you have some disaster, people want to know, is this climate change? Did climate change flood my house? I've had that question. Um, after the heat, deadly heat wave of 2003 in Europe that had 70,000 people uh, dying attributed to that 
season-long heat wave, most of whom were elderly, most of whom were in France and Italy, um, some in other countries as well, though. Sorry, what year is it? That was 2003. And, um, and in 2004, my colleague, uh, Miles Allen at the University of Oxford, proposed that we could actually ask, answer this question, and the question, but not this exact question, but rather, how has the risk of this event changed because of climate change? And so recognizing that extreme weather always has happened, but it's happening more frequently, so can we quantify how much more frequently a heat wave, that was the first kind we talked about, how much more frequently does that temperature be, is reached because, of, because the climate is a degree warmer? Colleagues of mine in Colorado at uh, the, the ESRL, which I've forgotten what that stands, but it's a NOAA laboratory in Boulder, Earth Sciences Research Lab, actually, uh, Marty Hurling, and, and he asked a different question. And he asked, how, much, how did the climate change affect the magnitude of this event? Or fixing the rarity, the probability, said, how much warmer is that event? And, and there was some, some discussion about, you know, different conclusions on uh, the Texas heat wave that followed in 2010, I think, from these two groups, because the answers look to be different. But in fact, they're the same. These are the same questions. They're just different ways of framing the question. And so, um, so it turned out that, that Marty's group and Miles' group were not inconsistent at all on when you know, people thought that maybe it was. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about, oh, so here's some three different heat waves. So in Europe in 2003, it had 70,000 people died. Russia in 2010, 50,000 people died. Um, that in excess deaths, this is how epidemiologists measure this. You know, so many people die every year. That year, a lot more people died. So, um, so that's in excess, you said? That's the excess oh. deaths. Ex excess deaths is the technical term these people use. That's a lot of folks. You know, that's a lot of people's grandmothers and grandfathers. Mostly. mostly. Not entirely, but mostly. It's usually the very old, the very young, and the very ill. Um, and different places that can, you know, that can change. In California, because we have so much um, uh, air conditioning in places that are hot, the, the, it turns out the, the group that's most at risk for heat waves in the Central Valley are mid-50s Hispanic males. Who are those folks? That's pretty obvious. They're undocumented farm workers. And they're working outside. And they're working outside. And they're not very healthy to begin with. They're working under very bad conditions. And they, for one reason or another, they don't have the option to not work outside. And so it varies from one place to the next. But for these, that, that's how it went. In Texas, we don't, it's odd, it's odd, we know a lot about how many people died in these European events, but not in the United States because. What is, the person, what is it as a percentage? Uh, of the total deaths? Uh -huh. That I don't know. I don't know. Is that Western Europe only or Western and Eastern? Uh, 2003 was mostly Western Europe, yeah. yeah. And uh, I don't think it went that far east. Um, yes, question? Yes, there are, um, but I can't discuss them because I don't know them. Um, that's not what I do. I mean, I read these things from in journals, articles that seem credible, but, you know, these are widely agreed upon. Uh, 2011, because we don't have good records in the U.S. because we don't have centralized, socialized medicine, essentially, um, uh, we don't know how many people died. Um, and it's presumably a lot fewer because people have air conditioning. Um, but there were a lot of cows, and I say a lot of dead cows. Those were cows that went to slaughter early because uh, feed prices were so high. Because, um, and so a friend of mine was a rancher, and basically he just sent everybody, every, all, the, um, all, the, all the cattle to the slaughterhouse, bank, bank the money, bank the money, and then when times are good, he goes buys more cows. And so that depressed the price of, of uh, beef, and, uh, and um, the state of Texas wrote, the state of Texas wrote that drought cost them $8 billion. So what cost? What was the fact that the, they, all these cows went to market at once and, and the price dropped. What makes the heat wave? How did this uh, get up? Well, that's, that's a good question, and that's what we're after. So we're interested in the rarity of these events and how it changed. And, and I'm going to put one equation up. It's pretty simple. It's called the risk ratio. It really should be called the probability ratio, but we don't need to go to that. It's the probability of the event 
in the world that we're at versus the probability of the event in some hypothetical world that we dream up that represents what the climate would have been like had humans not interfered with it. And so for the European heat wave, my, my colleagues in, in Oxford wrote that it was twice as likely to happen in 2003 than in 1850 because of climate change. Now, there are all sorts of reasons why it happened that are meteorological. And we're basically saying, OK, the chances of those blocking events, they're called, doesn't change. This is just the feedbacks of being hotter. And for Russia, it was two to three times. Uh, in 2010, in Texas, it was also about two. Now, what you'll see is I also put the risk in 20, uh, 2023. And the reason it's 2023 is some, when I made these calculations in 2013, somebody asked, well, what's it going to be like in 10 years? So it's an old slide. I apologize. But we're almost at 2023. And you can see that now the risk of the European heat wave is, is uh, 35 times larger than it would have been in 1850. So in 2018, it's somewhere between 2 and 35, probably closer to 35. And in fact, this picture here shows the probability. So that would be this number here, the probability in the real world that we estimated. That in 1990, it was, a, it was about the width of the line. So it's almost zero. Not quite. Not zero, but almost zero. But in 2040, our best estimate of this is that it's a 90% event. In other words, nine out of 10 events in 20, nine out of 10 summers in Europe in 2040 will be as warm as the 2003, which was a record at the time. Why is it worse in Europe than Russia? Oh, and that, that's a good question. Why is it worse? Why, she asked, why is it worse in Europe than in Russia and Central, Central US? And it's because climate change is not a uniform process. It's not uniform everywhere on the planet. It's not uniform in time, for sure. And so there, it was still really zero. I mean, I can't plot it in this scale to show it. It was, it was, very, it was much smaller in Russia in 1990 than in Europe, even though they were both small numbers. And in the US, it's already in between. And so um, well, that's what I want to say about that, I guess. I had another thought, but I lost it. Now I want to talk about storms, which Heat waves are so easy now that it's, you know, I, I wrote about it last year. It's, you know, it's just a boring paper because, you know, I put some uncertainty trying to make it, try to do a little bit better statistics. That made it scientifically interesting, but it's kind of a no-brainer. And so last year, this summer's heat wave in California, a reporter called me up and said, well, how much, how much warmer is it because of climate change in these heat waves? And it's like, well, actually, I just did that calculation. You know, I did it globally. So I went and I looked at the, at the plots, and I had to make them all big because they were, they were global plots. And I said, OK, well, at the, at the coast, maybe 2 degrees Fahrenheit. And in the central, this is in LA, and in the, the, the valleys you know, uh, farther away from the coast, probably 4 degrees. And you know, the fact that I could do that without, you know, in like 15 minutes, shows how routine this kind of thing is. Storms are a whole other story. They're much more complicated. This, this storm in 2013 in Colorado was devastating. Here you can see it. it caught, 10 people died, 11,000 people, 11, people had to evacuate. It, it actually cost $3 billion, I think is a better estimate now. 19,000 homes damaged. Um, some towns were cut off completely in the mountains. It, I don't know about disease, actually. These were the immediate uh, casualties. This is a, uh, a satellite image of uh, moisture. And this is actually dry air, and then this is the wet air. And what you can see is it's a really complicated, you know, it's hard to explain, but it's a really complicated meteorological pattern. It's really, really rare. Basically, the air is kind of blocked here, and so it's raining like crazy here. And there's a lot of moisture being transported up from the Gulf. Now, I could run my climate model for a million simulated years, which would take me, <laughs> take me about 1,000 years to do it. So I guess I can't do that. Um, I'd have to run it about a million years in order to get this pattern replicated enough so I could make some statistical argument about it. So for this experiment, and this is going to tie into the hurricanes, I had to 
devise a new way of doing this. I had a had a punt on some of the questions so I could actually answer a few more restricted questions. And, and what we did is we took a, a weather prediction model and instead of, instead of um, as, so what we did in the heat waves, we run a climate model with the world that was and the world that might have been had people not um, interfered with the climate system. The difference here is now I did it with a weather prediction model. So I initialize the model so that this storm is going to happen. And then we go and we do it again. In, we initialize the storm again, but this in a world that's colder by a degree, and ask, how does that change? And so we get two distributions of precipitation. The blue one here is the world that was, the event that was. The actual event is this black line, that's the observations, and you see the, 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 the hindcast. The hindcast is a forecast you make after the event. The hindcast is pretty good. I mean, it's right, right in the middle. It's, here's the hindcast in the world that might have been, the green one, and it's shifted to lower values. And so what we found is that there was a 30% increase in our best estimate of the precipitation from from uh, this storm. So there was 30% more rain because of climate change in, over the seven days uh, where it rained a lot in September 2013 in Colorado. And this was sort of surprising because the, the warming, there's a relationship, again, from steam engine days called the clausius clapeyron relationship. And what that tells us is that the saturation specific humidity, that's the amount of water that the atmosphere can hold, increases by about 7% per um, degree of warming. Now we thought that, this, that there was maybe uh, uh, two degrees of warming in the moisture source in the Gulf at this time, um, for this part of the Gulf anyway. And so that would say that, the, that there should be 15% more moisture in the atmosphere. And then if the assumption is that that's the controlling factor for the amount of rain that happens, there should be 15% more precipitation, but we came up with 30. This caused us nine months delay in the publication of this paper because my colleagues, Pardee, Paul, and Dahi Stone, and I just couldn't figure it out, and we just didn't want to go to the journals with, with, without an explanation for this. And finally, Pardee, who is quite the genius, asked a question. He says, well, can we, can we ask about convective precipitation versus the larger scale? So, so it turned out we fortunately had saved the right variables. We went in and we came up with this, the fact, the, 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 the conclusion that the storm was, was um, more unstable to, to something called convection, which is um, uh, uh, the big thunderhead clouds that, 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 that rise. And the ri as they rise, they rain out. And, um, and so, so much so that the storm is actually more efficient at precipitating out that water. So there was 15% more water from this clausius clapeyron um, relationship, but it was twice as efficient in raining it out because of the storm was more violent, I think is the best way to describe it. And so climate change increased the precipitation, but it also made the storm more violent. And that's kind of an interesting um, uh, uh, conclusion. And once we figured that out, we hurried up and wrote the paper. Do you use a different grid for uh, these models, or is it the same? Uh, uh, we use a much finer grid. In that case, we used a nine-kilometer grid. I'll show you some very fine <coughs> simulations at the very end. I have another movie of Katrina. Uh, I should have probably put this before. This was a heat wave in Pakistan. Um, and not all heat waves are the same. Um, in Pakistan in 2015, thousands of people died. We don't know how many people died because they can't count them there. But um, thousands of people died. I saw this on the news. A father was distraught because his children had died, his young children had died. I'm, I'm a father. My kids are older. But you know, I was moved. Yeah, I really was. I'm, you know, I'm tend, I tend to be kind of hard on this you know, and try to be clinical. But this time I wasn't. This time it was like, God, I just couldn't. I felt really bad. And, and I thought, well, this is an event that I should look at. And there haven't been that many. Most of the events that we've looked at have been in the developed nations. You know, there's a correlation between the events that have been studied and the distance to where the lead author's home is. And so I've never been to Pakistan nor India. And so, um, so I decided this was something to look at. And, and what we found out is that in, in, and this is observations in Hyderabad, and this is in Karachi, 
and this is temperature, and this is relative humidity. And so it's a scatter plot of all the different values that we had. The black ones are during the heat waves. And what we found is that in Hyderabad, which happened five weeks before, and lots of people died there um, as well, but that one was a hot and dry event, and in Karachi it was a hot and humid event, so you were much higher, you know, 40% kind of humidities. And when I talk about this risk ratio, my best estimate in India for this hot dry event is that it was 30 times more likely because of climate change. That's a big number. But in Pakistan, I wrote it was, a, it was more than 1,000. I could have written 10,000, but that was so crazy large that I wrote just greater than 1,000. That's still, you know, at this point was the largest um, factor that any climate, that any weather event had been changed by, um, by climate change. And it's because this was a hot and humid event rather than a hot and dry event. But I'm sorry I'm out of order here. I should have talked about this before. Oh, here's, here's, a, here's those histograms. So this is the world that was and the world that might have been for something called the heat index, which is a, a measure of, uh, um, of discomfort that's a function of temperature and relative humidity. Excuse me. Oh, yeah. Why is it that humidity uh, uh, can kill you more easily? Oh, that's a really good question. The question is, why is humidity, high humidity and heat dangerous, I think is what you're asking. And the reason is because um, your body cools itself um, by, by, by evaporating s moisture. You know, usually you sweat, and as it evaporates off, that, uh, they call it the latent uh, heat of evaporation, that evapor evaporation process cools you. And so if you can't sweat, that's why dogs pant, because they can't sweat. They have to get rid of the heat some other way. Um, um, that, that, that's why it's so Dutch dangerous, because the efficiency at which um, the sweat evaporates is lower when it's hot and humid. If the relative humidity is 100%, it won't evaporate at all. And so um, um, if it's zero, then it's the most efficient. And so, so hot and dry um, for, for the same temperature isn't as dangerous as hot and humid. So back to storms and now hurricanes. The hurricanes are the most violent storms on the planet on the large scale. They have the most energy in them. I mean, tornadoes, I suppose, at a point are more, can be more destructive for a point. But on the large scale, the hurricanes are the largest ener energetic storms. And so we, we developed using that methodology for the hurricanes, or for the September 2013, rather, rain in Colorado. We use the same thing for, um, for hurricanes. And so the questions then were, how did climate change affect the maximum wind speeds, um, which is also asking the same as the central minimum pressures. The pressures in the middle of the, the, the eye of the storm is very low. Um, and also, how did climate change affect hurricane precipitation? Now, these questions are related. This is all new. The first papers on this were written last year with Hurricane Harvey. And Mark and I wrote really the first quantitative papers, the second paper. It came out in December of 2017. Um, the storm was in August. And then now we have a paper that's forthcoming. Um, I'll show some pictures from it. It actually is embargoed. Um, uh, it's going to be in a journal called Nature, um, which is the premier scientific journal. Uh, it's my first paper in Nature in 30 some odd years of doing this, 40 years of doing this. Um, and then Flor Hurricane Florence, which of course isn't even over yet. So for Hurricane Harvey, we used actually a statistical model of the world that was and the world that wasn't. This is the, uh, these are the stations that we used. We, uh, we did a, a, a statistical technique to turn it into a smoother plot, and, um, and then we compared it to a radar image as well. And so this is actual radar imagery. This is our, our smooth version of the station data. And um, we estimated that we made two estimates about the precipitation that uh, magnitude. And one is that, um, that our best estimate is that there was 38% more rain in Hurricane Harvey because of climate change. Because Mark's a statistician, we could do a very good job on the, on the uncertainty, on the confidence intervals. And so we came up with another statement in the language of the IPCC, a, the calibrated language, uh, that it is likely at least 19%. The key words there being likely and at least. Um, these are much bigger numbers than I expected ahead of time. I was interviewed 10 times um, during the storm. 
Um, once live on the BBC, which I can tell you, live television is absolutely as scary as it sounds. Um, um, but the, the, at that time, I thought I, uh, the conservative estimate, and I'm a very conservative guy when it comes to this kind of stuff. It might not sound like, but I am. Um, was that there was maybe six or seven percent increase, and that was from this Clausius Clapeyron argument that there was about a degree of warming in the Gulf. We expect that the humidity would go up by six or seven percent. I didn't think that this same efficiency argument of um, in the in the Boulder event would apply. Um, it turned out I was wrong. That there is something going on that's making the storm more efficient at precipitating. So we found so that so the interesting thing about that paper, it was in the Geophysical Review letters, is our colleagues in at the uh, um, in the Netherlands and at the University of Oxford were looking at it at the same time. I knew they were looking at it. Uh, Gert Jan von Olderberg contacted me and said, you know, maybe we should collaborate. And I said, no, let's not. Let's stay independent. Um, first of all, I wanted to be before him because he's always before me, and I thought I had to jump on him. <laughs> um, and um, and, but, but beyond that, there was a good reason for it. It's like, let's do this independently so we have independent estimates. And indeed, that's what we did. Um, we, um, we, we looked at it very different ways with different data, different techniques, and came up with essentially the same answer. The editors of the two journals decided that it would be cool if the <laughs> articles came out on the same day, so I didn't beat Gary Gunn. Um, but we did a news conference, and that's actually online. I have a website at the lab if you search for me. You can see all the media that I've been able to collect. Um, uh, one of them is a is a uh, discussion about this, uh, these other papers, and and there's actually another one that's happened last April from people that I don't even know, who come up with the same answer. And so there are five there are five papers, four of which address this issue rather head on, and each one of them is within the same, within, are, are providing answers that are within each other's uncertainties. So I'm very confident to say that climate change increased the precipitation in Hurricane Harvey by amount greater than the six to seven percent of, of the Clausius clapron you know, and with our best estimate of 38, another of 25, I mean, you know, we can argue the details, but it's a lot. Um, and th that has impacts in terms of, what, of, of where the flooding stopped. You know, how high did the, did, did the how, what was the extent of the flooding? It's not, it's not one to one. And um, we have some people working on this now who can run flood models. You have to be able to do the hy local hydrology. We only talked about the amount of water that fell on the ground. Where it goes is a whole different kind of science. So this is our paper in Nature with uh, Christina Patricola, another brilliant young scientist at, um, at uh, uh, the Berkeley Lab. And here we looked at uh, Katrina, Irma, and Maria. And you were asking about uh, the, the models and how we configured it. In Katrina, we started with 27 kilometers, and we went all the way down to three. And we asked, different, we asked you know, do our answers change as we simulate this storm more accurately. And the last thing I'll show you is a movie at three kilometers of Katrina. And what we found is that we don't actually see much difference in the wind speeds under the current climate change in this particular weather forecast model. What we need to do is go back. We have, we have another model that we can run, which is what we ran for Florence. I'll talk about that in a minute, where we need to see how robust these, that conclusion is, that we don't see much change. But for all the, we looked at a, we looked at actually 15 storms altogether, and under this uh, biz, this no policy scenario, the red means that it, there's a higher wind speed, and for almost all of them, it um, it is increased in this four degree warmer world. So we don't see much effect now, but as the world changes, we'll see a lot more on these particular storms in this particular uh, model framework. Um, it's not the final word. These two storms, Andrew, I, can, I don't actually understand Andrew. Bob is thrown in there because Chris is from um, New England and Bob was the storm that got her interested in climate change. Or in meteorology, actually. These are precipitation maps. Uh, this is what we simulate for uh, the composite across all the uh, simulations for the world that was. 
this is how much change we see in, actually it says today's change, but I meant the change at the time of the storm. Um, so there is an enhancement in a part of the storm. Um, and you see that in each of these. Under this future change, this is the no policy scenario, you see there's a really big um, uh, change. In fact, it seems that the parts that are raining the most rob moisture from the outside of the storm. This is, this is the explanation for why the, um, the uh, precipitation increases that we see in, in, our other, uh, in Harvey, for instance, and in these storms is larger than I expected from the thermodynamic arguments. And it's a different mechanism to this super clausius clapron scaling than we had in, in, um, in Colorado. And I think that's a, that's a point that has only just been grasped, is that there are different ways to get to this very high rates. And Florence. <clears throat> so we only were able to do the first attribution statements on hurricanes with Harvey last year. This year, my young colleague at Stony Brook um, University um, has a brilliant grad student who could run one of these models as a forecast model. And so he called me up on Monday last week and said, I think we can do an attribution statement. We can forecast an attribution statement. So make a statement about the climate change before the event ever happened. Nobody had ever done that before. Um, there are some of my colleagues who think that's foolish. There are others who think it's innovative and bold. Um, and then there are folks in Washington who don't like it at all. They don't want me talking about this. So anyway, this was our forecast. It was initialized around here. By the time we compared to it, um, you could see that there wasn't a lot of spread in the forecast. The, uh, the red is the world that was. One of the storms stalled off here, actually. Um, and then, um, then uh, blue is the world in a uh, the, the storm in the cooler world, the the the, uh, the the storm that might have been. And the the thing that was that struck us about this forecast was first of all that the for, the red forecast was really similar to what National Hurricane Center was doing at that time. We initialized from their fields, different model, and not as finely resolved. And quite frankly, we're not forecasters. The National Hurricane Center is. They're a lot better at this than I am. But our forecast was, was quite credible. And especially um, the next picture, which is, this was the forecasted precipitation by our model. And I checked m numerous times. This, this, this stayed relatively constant as time went on f at the National Hurricane Center. It's certainly within the uncertainty range that National Hurricane Center had. So we realized that on Tuesday evening, and we made a decision that we would make an attribution statement, and, um, and so we contacted some reporters, and, um, and uh, some of them ran with it. And the, the point was we compared, compared this to the, the, the forecast. Now, this is a forecast, not a, hind, a retrospective analysis, of the actual storm with a forecast of the storm in this cooler uh, world without human interference. And you could see that you know, this is obviously a lot less precipitation. Turns out that in this, this, uh, this region here, um, it's about 50% more. So we, we, told the, we wrote a write up, we put it on, on the Stony Brook website. So 50% more rain, that's a lot, it's a big number. We also wrote that the storm was 50 miles larger in diameter. That's another new thing that we have in the last uh, year and a half. That was another young colleague's uh, PhD dissertation at MIT named Dan Chavas. I call it the Chavas radius. Um, and then we wrote that it was going to stay more intense longer. So now our task is to go back and dissect this forecast. And what I told management was, you know, this is what I'm really interested in, and if I don't tell anybody, it's not a forecast. I could have done the calculation, not tell anybody, who cares? You know, it's not, a hot, it's not a forecast if you don't tell anybody. So we made the forecast, for better or worse. It's all over the Internet. Um, I think what's going to be robust is the 50% number, to in our analysis, and the size number. The storm weakened sooner than this forecast, which was essentially the same as National Hurricane Center, predicted. And that 
you know, shows the risk in making a forecast is that your forecast can be wrong. They often are. Um, and so, um, so that's, that's, that's our, our next, ta so next task. So to make the forecast, do you run the model once or do you have an ensemble? We, we ran it 10 times. So um, and we'll run, forecast but is based on the problem. On, 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 on the, there's, there's 20 simulations here, 10 of, 10 of each world. And what we'll do is we'll go back and we'll run it 30 or 100 times. Um, Alyssa was up all night <laughs> on Monday to do this. And um, so, so on Tuesday night, we didn't ask her to do it again. And then the, then the computer went down, which is another difference between a university <laughs> and, and, and an operational center. The operational centers, they don't take them down for maintenance in the middle of a storm. So the 50% value that you got, what was the range across those 10 simulations? Oh, that's a good question. I don't know the answer right now. And, 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 but that's going to be one of the questions we ask, is what's the range in the 10 versus the range in a 30 or 100 member ensemble? Um, the, uh, one of the things that I thought, but and it shows what little, how little I knew about forecasts, is that you know, two months from now, there'll be a published data set for the observed um, uh, sea surface temperatures. And I thought, well, that'll give us a better forecast. But um, Kevin tells me that it won't be all that much different than the uh, data we got from National Hurricane Center for, because this, this um, was just initialized. Yes, in the back, please. I have a question. It seems like, and I've seen a lot of hurricanes with my daughter with the DBI, and they have a lot of hurricanes coming at the same time as when she was in college. And they have a lot of hurricanes coming at the same time as when she was in college. And I was watching them as a father, like, very intently. But it seems like they're coming out of, when they want to come out of the Sierra, they run it about four or five miles an hour, and then they start accelerating as they get into open ocean. And is that acceleration a part of climate change? Or they start to grow massively, like the one like Florence did? Because when they go into shore, they're traveling at the same speed <coughs> they used to travel at six or eight miles an hour. We don't know. We don't we know. know no, in fact, another colleague of mine, Jim Costin at, um, at NOAA in Wisconsin, published a paper in Nature just a couple weeks ago that showed that there's a, a slowing down, in fact, yeah, of, yeah. of hurricanes. And um, a, lot of, a lot of the press picked up on this and said, oh, climate change is making them slow down, and that's increasing the amount of precipitation in, in a given spot. But I'm not, I, I, I don't doubt that they're slowing down. But I don't know whether or not that's climate change or if that's just some artifact of a natural variation in the data. And that, that's going to require, in fact, my my, I looked at this very question in those projections that I showed you, the, the blue and the, the red um, curves or, or histograms, and I didn't find a, um, a simulation in my calculations. Now, Jim is, on, is looking at observations. That's different, of course. And I didn't look at it the same way as Jim. So I need to go back and do that. Um, the, Well, you might think so, but also there's there's way more energy, and so um, that that moisture has latent heat in in it. So it's 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 a very nonlinear thing. So we don't know. There certainly have been a bunch that have done that, and and you know this is this is why science is interesting. Again, I want to change gears. I have only a couple more slides. Um, fires. Two weeks ago. Three weeks ago, maybe, you know, the, the press was on me all the time. You know, what do you know about fires? And I know very little about fires. I happened to write the chapter in the National Assessment that did talk about fires, so I had to read a lot of papers about it. And this, this, I put this figure in the U.S. National Assessment because I found it so disturbing. And what it shows is that across the western United States, there's a trend in the number of large fires. Now, I've since learned that there's not a trend in the number of fires. That's more or less the same. So the ignition doesn't seem to have a, a, a trend in it, but the number of the, the, the acres does. And, um, and everywhere except in California, which is kind of interesting, this part of California, which is kind of interesting. Um, so climate change affects fires in two ways, or, or f climate change affects fires in one way, but humans have affected it in two ways. Humans have interfered with the natural cycle of fires, and so there's more fuel available. The, fires, the forests are denser, so when they burn, they can burn um, uh, hotter. What climate change has done is it's, inc so that includes the fuel loading. What climate change has done is it dries out faster and dries out more. 
and in the hot in the hot dry seasons of the summer in the western U.S. And so climate change has increased the flammability. So we have two effects, both of which work in the same way to make fires worse. And so how much of these trends in fires in, in, is due to increased temperatures and how much is it due to increased fuel loading is a really interesting question. Now this data, good data, only goes back to 1984. And there's been a lot of climate change since 1984. Most of the climate change, most of the observed climate change comes from about then. There's not a lot of actual changes in forest management practices. In fact, if anything, it would go the other way. Um, and so um, it, it suggests that, um, that the climate change has had an effect on, on, these, on this observed increase in fires, not just here, but elsewhere. And, you know, uh, you, there were very bad fires in Spain and Portugal and Greece this year as well, um, which are similar kind of climates to the Western U.S. Greece, a lot of people died in Greece. Um, Australia. Oh, and then there's Australia. And then there's Australia, which um, I was at an intergovernmental panel on climate, an IPCC meeting in Hobart in Tasmania. And as we flew in, not only could you see the smoke, you could see the flames. And, uh, and, and somebody, a uh, firefighter died while we were there. I mean, you know, it, Australia's uh, um, fires is kind of a nightmare. So that's one thing that, you know, we don't get hurricanes here. So that's one thing that affects us. The other is the Sierra snowpack. We rely, California relies on the Sierra snowpack for um, our water. Our, our, my, I live in San Francisco, the water comes from Hetch Hetchy. Um, but uh, um, the Central, Agri Central Valley agriculture you know, relies on, 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 on moisture that falls in the Sierra. It falls as snow. We use the Sierra snowpack as a giant reservoir. And, and we have these aqueducts and, le and levees and everything to, to control that. It doesn't, it's not, not too hard a leap to understand that as it gets warmer, especially in a marginal kind of snow situation like we have in much of the Sierra, like where the ski areas are, that it's no longer going to fall as, as, as snow but falls as rain. So even if the pattern of precipitation doesn't change, the form it takes does. And so this is a, a simulation that I put in the U.S. National Assessment and in, actually in the fourth, national, uh, fourth California Assessment that just came out, although we redrew it to be more California-centric. Um, what you can see is by the middle of the century, there's a decrease. By the end of the century, it's catastrophic. And in fact, 95% uh, of the Sierra snowpack, which is this part here, is gone at the end of the century. This is true in other catchments as well. The Wasatch is really bad, and, and uh, Columbia is bad too. All the lower catchments won't have snow in them in February in, um, in a three and a half degree warmer world. So then that begs the question is, what will California do? I don't know. I really don't. Um, Oregon's not going to be a whole lot better. I mean, you know, well, I mean, the problem is that, you know, even the places that have snow, these are the very highest mountains. And so those are not the places that we rely on now, so there aren't dams in the right places to capture this snow, for instance. And so um, this is, a, this is a, a problem that is here and now, or not here and now, but rather one, it is here and now, actually. We have measured changes in the Sierra uh, timing of the snow melt. It's, it's melting earlier. Um, but um, but this, this catastrophic problem is one that, you know, we're on the track for. Um, we got to do something about that, I think, you know, if California is going to maintain its viability as a place that, that, you know, can support the number of people that live here and support the agricultural economy that it has. Um, so I'm almost done. So uh, the risk of extreme weather has increased. I hope I've convinced you of that. Um, technology helped a lot in the, answering some of these questions. Um, the, the, what is dangerous climate change? I'm asked this a lot. And, and I answer it, it's here now. You know, that Pakistani event was 1,000 times more likely. There's 40%, 50% more rain in these big storms. That seems pretty dangerous to me. And so this isn't a problem for our grandchildren. This is a problem for us. And, and, and there's not much we can do about stopping it. There's a lot we can do to adapt. 
you know, and there's lots of ways, you know, we could discuss that if you want, but there are lots of ways to do that. The often espoused two degree target is some safe climate change, I find completely ridiculous. For one reason, it's not going to happen unless, you know, I'm really just way overly pessimistic. The likelihood of it under the path we're on now is extremely unlikely in the calibrated language of the IPCC. And, um, and you know, that's that. So thank you, but I'm not done. Here's some resources if you want, but I really want to go to the movie. And then I'll take your questions while the movie's playing. This is a movie of Hurricane Katrina at the finest resolution we could. And the red dot should be only observations. Everything else is signal. Where, where was Katrina? Katrina was uh, New Orleans in 2005. Did it just hit New Orleans? No, no, this is 2005. This was the most expensive hurricane ever. But was it just New Orleans? Uh, no, it was the whole uh, Mississippi, especially. The red dots are the observations of the middle of the storm. The, the, the plot is made to look like observations, and it does look like observations, but it's a simulation. But, but what attitude uh, uh, New Orleans uh, was, was the levees breaking? The levees broke because this was a big storm. <laughs> but in, um, in, uh, in Bay St. Louis, the flooding was um, 30 feet. And um, you know anybody who was there drowned and was washed out to sea. And many of those people were uncounted, the poor. And nobody cares about the poor, apparently. I do, but so thank you. I'll take questions now. Uh, the largest was Patricia, actually, which was a Pacific storm in the eastern Pacific. Haiyan was a devastating storm. And we've done this, this essentially, you didn't ask about Haiyan. Haiyan's the example of why this is hard. Um, I have two different models. I get two different answers on the human change to Haiyan. Um, and uh, I think I understand some of that. It has to do with warming at the surface and warming aloft. But each one of the, what we learned from Haiyan is that each storm is different. And when were those two? Haiyan was in 2012. I forget when Yolanda was. 2013, okay. How about Patricia? Patricia was 2014 or 15. And so, so, um, so we are seeing, and it's hard to be rig rigorous in a statistical sense, but we, the, most, the most intense storms are in the last four or five years. Well, why? Because of climate. Largest in extent. Yeah, I was referring to um, wind speeds. And Sandy actually was um, uh, only a Category 1 or Category 2 storm, but um, that shows some of the problems with our categories. This actually was a massive storm. It was the uh, second most powerful storm in terms of energy in the Atlantic ever. Well, that, why, well, why the last five years? Because of because of global warming. Just because of global Simple, warming. I think. You know that's that's and that's that's uh, that's what the that's what the that's what the. Well, um, it 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 it's been going on really since it's been going on since since the uh, 1790s, but. You really don't see any real change in, in global average temperatures that's significant until around the 1980s it started turns on. This was in one of the early plots. Um, it's been the last few years that we've really seen the difference in hurricanes. I will get to my questions, but I, I, just, I think it's rather complicated. Let's be optimistic and, and that people can uh, change climate change, reduce the amount of global warming, or at least the rate of global warming. If that's true, and if there are these differential amounts of damage and suffering that happens in different parts of the world, can, can, the, more, can the more democratic nations suffer through misinformation by those that are less democratic and don't suffer so much? I, I yeah. have, actually have Russia in mind. You notice that in yeah. the heat waves, that Russia is not going to be suffering very much, whereas Western Europe is. Well, 50,000 people died in their heat wave. In, in Russia? In 2010. I think that's, that, 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 that's suffering in my book. Um, uh, you know, and, and, and uh, 
you know, the, uh, the Siberian uh, boreal forests are burning more as well. I mean, you know, they don't have good data on it, but they're, this, they're not any different than our mountains in many ways. Um, and so they will have more fires. Fires also have impacts on us in, through air quality. So even if, you know, I had friends who lost their houses in the Sonoma fires last year, but those, the people in the fires are impacted the most, but all of us in California and the Western United States have, have been impacted by the low air quality, and, and, and that undoubtedly led to people dying as well. You asked, you know, to, you know, where's the optimism here? And I think, I don't have a lot. Um, uh, the, the, um, I think the metric has to be some metric of suffering. And, um, you know, how can we reduce suffering? And we can reduce it two ways. We can reduce it by, by slowing down climate change, or we can reduce it by adapting. And the reality is we probably have to do both. Um, the politics of, of uh, mitigating by reducing the amount of our reliance on fossil fuels is really complicated, far, far above my pay grade. Um, the issues of adapting, I think, are, are um, a little more obvious. Like, you know, you don't build in places that are, that are susceptible to storm surge um, in, uh, in, in, in Houston, or you don't rebuild. Um, we, rebuilt, we rebuilt New Orleans. We rebuilt those levees. We rebuilt, rebuilt, the Army Corps of Engineers built, rebuilt the levees to the same standard that they were. Does that make any sense? Well, the reason is because of cost. I mean, you know, to make them to a category, they were, they were rated for Cat 3, to make them a Cat 5 would cost a lot more. And so, you know, they just didn't have the budget. And so, so those kinds of decisions are ones that we as a society have to make. You have a question in the back? Um, I don't have a lot of questions, but I <laughs> I don't have a lot of answers, I'm sorry. <laughs> Not the change is the temperature, and then we'll infer a temperature change. Um, but there is data now. Um, it just there's a process that um, does quality control that. Um, well, sea level rise happens um, for two reasons. Um, one is the water's warmer just thermal expansion, it gets bigger. You know, when things get, when you, you eat something up, they get larger. Um, um, but then the big, and that's responsible for most of the, um, the observed sea level rise that we've had that's due to humans. Um, but then the big one is a melting of the, the land glaciers. Now, a lot of the glaciers in the Western North America have melted already, and that has contributed to sea level rise a couple inches, maybe an inch or two. I've forgotten the numbers exactly. The big, the big, uh, the 800 pound gorilla in the room is, um, well, is West Antarctica. The 300 pound gorilla is Greenland. Um, um, both of these are showing signs of, of uh, instability. It's West Antarctica that we're worried about most. Um, and as, as, um, as the, uh, the ice shelf retreats, um, there's questions about the stability of West Antarctica. West Antarctica covers about a third of Antarctica, and the big fear is that the whole thing just slides into the um, into the sea, and that would raise sea level up, you know, by 20 feet or something. Um, uh, these are catastrophic events. Um, it's not. It's not. It's not something that um, people are making projections about now. Um, it's thought. Well, the truth of the matter is we don't really understand it that well. And then, just if I could just ask one more, and then I'll be quiet. Um, so you're working on this. You're Lawrence Livermore's work. Berkeley, Berkeley, Berkeley. Berkeley. Livermore's um, another lab. And then I've heard things about UC Davis's <coughs> research on flood maps and so forth. Um, what other big, um, what other people are working on this that you think are the most important. Well, that the um, the the Sierra um, figure I showed that came from Davis from a, a PhD dissertation at Davis, and we we very uh, wisely hired him as a postdoc at Brigham Lab. Um, 
there's, there's climate change research going on at all the major universities. Uh, there's great work in this very field at Stanford. Um, there's work uh, um, um, with even, you know, in, in, within the government at the Department of Energy, of course, it pays for me, um, but also uh, NASA and, uh, um, and NOAA laboratories, uh, the Geophysical Fluid Dynamic Lab stands out as one of those. Um, also, NSF uh, funds the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder. I could go on and on. Um, there's a lot of research in the United States. There's a lot of, a lot of research in, um, in Europe and in Japan, and uh, more and more in China, actually. Yes, please. I wanted to make an observation. You were talking about CO2 levels um, in the atmosphere this year. Um, <coughs> Amazon is going to become a net producer of CO2, and the government is passing laws this month to remove all of the control from the indigenous tribes on their land so that they can burn the rainforest. And they were saying on a, on a program I was watching on climate change that, that the Amazon is going to produce a net of 16% more carbon dioxide that it's going to extract from the atmosphere within the next five or six years. So are these kind of catastrophic events being put into these models that, that government agencies are destroying the environment? They want to drill the oil off California. Um, Putin is, is, is um, cutting deals with the Chinese for $800 billion worth of oil production. I mean, is that in the model, or is this just... Um, basic um, science, raw science temperature model. You're, n you're not trying to make me an optimist, are you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, the, the, it's a really good question. I mean, how do we, how do, we do this um, modeling, these projections? We don't call them um, forecasts we, or predictions. We call them projections because it's, it's highly conditional on what people do. And so um, these specific things that you talked about are not in our models. Um, what we do is the economists make, um, and the demogra dem demographers make up scenarios and say, okay, if this policy happens, then there'll be this many people in these countries. And if this technology for reducing emissions becomes um, uh, um, viable, then that will reduce or it doesn't. And so there are assumptions about economic growth. There's assumptions about population growth and assumptions about technology. And that's all they are, assumptions. And so all these projections are kind of, you know, none of them will be the re what really happens because there's always these kinds of examples that are unanticipated. Um, and so what we basically, you know, a friend of mine, a wise friend of mine said that these projections, these scenarios, and they're scenarios, are about choices. And, and to inform us on what choice we, what choices, what kind of world we want to live in and what choices we might have to make or what choices we could make to, uh, to realize those kinds of worlds. But all these worlds are going to be um, substantially warmer. I would hope that they would, that we get some sense and make some decisions to get off of this no policy scenario, which is that uh, very much warmest one. That is... I, like I described that is that's the worst case we considered. It is not the worst case. The worst case would be we burn all the coal, coal and oil, and then we burn all the tar sands. Um, it's the it's the fossil fuels that are the issue, though. It's the fossil fuels because the trees can grow back. Yeah, somebody said if we chop down all the trees, we won't have forest fires. This is true. <laughs> <laughs> Another question in the back. We're, I've, uh, we're probably out of time, I expect. But how about this? Would you be willing to take some questions? Uh, I'm confident here. Um, after we finish here. Absolutely, right. absolutely. Right. I just need to get a drink of water. How about this? First of all, as you uh, offer some applause here, I'll please thank. Oh uh, yeah, hold on, just do it. Please thank Cosette and the Alameda Free Library. Thank you, kind Wonderfest supporters who are here in the audience, and thank most of all, Dr. Michael Weiner. Thank you.